Good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to our panel. What promises to be a very exciting and informative panel. Uh, I'm Rick McGahee. I'm the Senior Vice President of Programs for INET, and thank you all both for coming to our uh, reawakening conference and particularly for coming to this session on uh, immigration and migration. Uh, one of the most challenging effects of economic disruption and demographic change and globalization around the world is, of course, mass migration and immigration, a force that's disrupting politics and economics around the world, including in Europe and the United States, where opposition to immigration has helped to fuel populist uh, nationalism. That opposition is often expressed in economic terms with reactions claiming that immigrants take jobs and hurt economies. Our panel will explore the differing views of economists on that question, uh, but we'll also go beyond that to talk about the politics and political issues associated with immigration and consider the future of immigration and migration in an increasingly globalized and economically disrupted world. We have a terrific panel. I'm going to introduce them all at once and then get out of their way. Uh, we have three speakers who will each get up to 15 minutes and then one commentator with 10 minutes. Then the panelists will have a chance to discuss with each other and uh, we'll get some time in for questions with the audience as well. So we have in order of presentation Christian Dustman, a professor of economics and director of the Center for Research and Analysis of Migration at University College London. Anne Hammerstadt, an honorary senior research fellow at the University of Kent. Uh, and Andrew Sheng, a longtime friend of INET and a distinguished fellow at the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. And our commentator is Philippe Lagrain, the founder of the Open Political Economy Network. And Christian, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you very much. So the title of uh, the session was Why do estimates of immigration's economic effects clash so sharply? Um, and my talk will be structured in uh, in, in, into three subsections, so I will definitely cover the first two. If I get the sign too early, probably I won't say much about the third. Uh, first of all, what are the economic effects of immigration and how can we measure them? What is the challenge to academic research to measure the economic effects of migration? I will give you some examples on that. Uh, secondly, do economic considerations matter actually for the way people assess immigration policy? And if not, what are the drivers of people's attitudes towards immigration and immigration policy? Suppose we knew everything about how immigration affects the economy. Uh, would that be something uh, which is valuable information for people who make voting decisions uh, when actually uh, deciding which party they would want to f vote for? And that brings me to the third point. How does immigration uh, affect voting outcomes? I will draw on various uh, bits of research uh, we have done uh, on that over the last one and a half decades. Uh, so why do estimates of immigration economic effects clash so sharply? Incidentally, we have actually just written a paper on that uh, which looks at the various reasons why uh, the literature on the wage impacts of migration uh, is, well, apparently uh, coming to different uh, results. Let me just summarize that here uh, and you can look at that uh, at, your, at, your, at your leisure. So the first reason is because actually the effect of immigration is different for every country and for every period within countries that we are studying. So other than many other areas in economics where we can generalize uh, results, uh, that is not something which is advisable when it comes to immigration. The effects of immigration depend on the composition of the immigrant population, depend on the composition uh, of the receiving country's population, they depend on the period over which migration occurs within the same country. Uh, they depend on uh, the type of migrants, where they are coming from, how long they intend to stay, etc., cetera, et cetera. So there are many uh, reasons why we should expect these effects to be heterogeneous. Uh, to conclude from what we learn, for instance, uh, about the U.S., uh, that we can kind of generalize that to Germany or other countries uh, is highly erroneous. Now, the second reason... Uh, why so many papers find different uh, effects is actually because they estimate often very different parameters, parameters which are not comparable. So, for instance, if you take uh, the economics of migration, uh, focusing on uh, the economic impact of migration on wages, uh, many papers uh, are actually estimating different effects. Some effect uh, estimate partial effects, which means, uh, for instance, the impact of unskilled immigrants on unskilled natives within a particular country. Other 
uh, estimate total effects, the impact of unskilled immigration on unskilled immigrants in that country, however, taking also account of complementarities between unskilled and skilled immigrants. So these parameters are different and often not comparable. So the third point on which I would like to extend a little bit more is actually measurement. The way what we, what we do in empirical work is we slice the labor market, we identify which part of the labor market is uh, differentially affected by migration, and we compare uh, the wage effects uh, this has, or the employment effect that has uh, on uh, native uh, workers. However, of course, a, 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 pre a prerequisite for that is that we are able to uh, find out where in a particular labor market uh, immigrants are actually occurring. Uh, in what part of the labor market do they compete with native workers. And that is challenging, and I will show you that in a number of graphs uh, which is based on some of the work we have done in the past. So in measuring the impact of migration uh, more generally, uh, we need to construct what we call a counterfactual situation. We need to understand what would have happened had migration not occurred. What we observe, for example, when we look at the wage impacts of migration, uh, is the wages of residents before and after immigration has taken place. What we would like to understand is, and what we would like that to compare to, is what the wages of immigrants, sorry, what the wages of residents would have been had migration not occurred. We call that uh, missing counterfactual. And I would think that the entire literature uh, can be actually structured into various approaches trying to reconstruct uh, this uh, missing uh, counterfactual. To come back to the measurement issue, I have pointed out before, uh, for example, if we take the UK, uh, the distribution of native earnings is just this horizontal line. Let's see where we would place immigrants if we would take their observed education and their observed age structure uh, to place them along the distribution of native wages. Well, this is how it looks like. We would particularly place them at the upper part of the distribution. Immigration to the UK is highly skilled. Immigrants to the UK have been for a long time, on average, better skilled than natives, and far less so at the lower part of the distribution. The problem, of course, is uh, that this is not a good indication where immigrants compete with natives in the labor market. Uh, the reality where they compete with natives in the labor market looks very different. Uh, that is the green line. So we have more density at the low end of the distribution, far less density in the middle of the distribution, and then again something uh, gumming up uh, at uh, the upper end of the distribution. So if we did compare or if we did conduct research based on the red line, uh, apparently we would get it uh, very, very wrong. Uh, so let's see uh, how that translates into the wage impact of immigration along the distribution of uh, wages of natives, uh, well, uh, this would be the graph if we estimated the impact of migration along the percentiles of native wages. We find a slight negative wage impact at the lower end of the distribution and relatively, uh, well, and, and positive effects further up the distribution, uh, which is very much uh, nearly a mirror image to the green line, which is based on completely different extracts from the data, uh, namely where we find immigrants in the distribution of wages. So if you would do that uh, according to whether you would allocate immigrants in the distribution of wages, you clearly uh, would get that uh, very wrong. So there are many challenges uh, in estimating wage impacts, employment impacts, impacts on innovation, et cetera, et cetera, of immigration, uh, very often, uh, well, related to uh, uh, constructing uh, uh, counterfactuals, uh, which are useful, but then also, of course, uh, there were many measurement issues, uh, and uh, that is an ongoing uh, field of research which is actually quite exciting. Of course, there were also dynamic effects. So what we usually pick up when we estimate the effects of migration is we compare, uh, well, uh, we, 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 we use approaches which, uh, which, which, which utilize those individuals who have just come to a particular country. To give you again an example, for the UK, the blue line is the location of immigrants where they are in the wage distribution in the UK uh, according to their observed characteristics. The red line is where we would allocate them according to uh, their, where, 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 where they actually, uh, the, the red line is where we would allocate them according to observed characteristics. 
over time, this particular entry cohort is uh, kind of upgrading their skills. So the red line would be where these individuals are after three to five years. Uh, the green line is where they are after five to ten years. Uh, and the yellow line is where they are after ten or more years. So you see they become more and more closely related to where in the first place we would expect them to be based on their education. So while they move up through the distribution of wages of natives, of course, they affect the wages of natives at different parts of the distribution. So we call that a, a particular dynamic uh, where the literature uh, is still uh, very unadvanced uh, to understand that uh, uh, fully. Now, let's kind of pause a little bit. Suppose, as economists, we would be able uh, to track down precisely how immigration uh, affects the receiving country. Would that be something which is important for individuals when they make their voting decisions or when they form their attitudes towards more or less liberal migration policy? So is immigration policy uh, related to the effect immigration has on the economy uh, and the way uh, individuals perceive that? Or is it something entirely different which affects uh, the uh, way immigration uh, policy is thought of by individuals? Is it non-economic uh, considerations? Is it cultural concerns which actually matter? So this is a question with, which together with, in particular, my colleague Ian Preston, I'm following up for, uh, well, nearly uh, two decades now. Uh, and let me just give you uh, some results uh, of that research, uh, which I think are quite interesting. Um, well, uh, we, uh, we started this some, some, some years ago when we, when we constructed a particular module for the European Social Survey uh, to, uh, with, uh, with, with the aim to distinguish uh, between uh, two different factors uh, which may affect the way individuals think about migration policy. So the one factor uh, we call uh, socio-cultural concerns. So this is uh, based on questions about uh, whether individuals uh, favor a common language, what individuals think about uh, a common religion, uh, etc. Things which are outside the economic uh, remit. Uh, the second factor is a factor which is related to economic concerns, such as labor market effects uh, in terms of employment, in terms of wages, uh, and uh, in terms of the fiscal uh, impact immigration may have. So I don't, I don't want to go into details how we are doing that. Um, let me just give you uh, some uh, results. So throughout that research, however we cut the data, we find that effects of economic concerns are far less important if it comes uh, for individuals to, uh, to, to form their attitudes about whether they want more or less uh, immigration uh, than uh, socio-cultural uh, concerns. So socio-cultural concerns are very important, no matter how we form that factor, which variables we include, which variables we exclude. We have done that for the uh, British Social Survey. We have done that for other surveys. So the social-cultural concerns always dominate uh, economic concerns uh, in the formation of these attitudes. Uh, they are important when individuals decide about migration policy. Do you want more or less migration? They are less important uh, if it comes to whether individuals think migration is a good or bad thing for the economy, uh, as we would expect. Uh, and they are again important when individuals decide whether immigration makes the country a better or worse place to live. Now, there is, uh, we have done that for many countries. Uh, so for every country for which we have done that, the social cultural concern is more important than the economic concern, as you can see by all these entries being uh, above uh, this uh, 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 red line. Uh, uh, the exception is Luxembourg, uh, which is the blue dot just uh, very close to that line. Now, do immigrants think different than natives when they form these, uh, these, these perceptions? Well, that's not the case. As you can see, even for immigrants within those countries, uh, socio-cultural concerns matter more uh, than economic concerns. We observe a gap in the way individuals form their attitudes to immigration, which is very much related to, uh, to education and which by many uh, scholars has been interpreted by some th as something which is related to labor market concerns. So low educated individuals have a more negative attitude towards more immigration and people uh, claim uh, that this is due uh, to uh, education 
uh, of uh, uh, to, to lower educated being more e exposed to the effects of immigration. Well, is that really uh, the case? Is it really labor market concerns or is it uh, socio-economic concerns, uh, socio-cultural concerns? We can actually, uh, using uh, the same analysis, uh, decompose that. And it uh, turns out that the gap uh, which is attributed to social-cultural concerns uh, is uh, the, or they, that, that this gap is mainly explained by uh, uh, social-cultural uh, concerns. Uh, so how does immigration uh, affect um, um, voting uh, behavior is basically the last thing I would like to talk to uh, you about um, and uh, clearly an issue which is very important. So I don't have much time anymore, so let me just summarize that. Um, we... In, in order to find that out, we would want to randomly allocate uh, immigrants across different areas in a particular country and then see how that affects the voting behavior of majority individuals. We have such an experiment taking place in Denmark in the 90s and 80s uh, where refugees have been randomly allocated across municipalities uh, and municipalities had no influence on how many refugees and what type of refugees they actually uh, receive. Uh, doing that, uh, let me just give you this last, um, uh, last slide here. Uh, we find that this type of uh, allocation of refugees has a very strong uh, impact on the vote shares uh, for uh, uh, right-wing uh, anti-immigration parties. It increases uh, their uh, share uh, let, let's in, in this particular diagram from 8.4% uh, to 9.7%, which is actually quite dramatic. So this is uh, due to a one percentage point increase in the share of refugees allocated uh, to a particular area. It decreases uh, the vote share uh, of center-left parties, and we have varying results uh, somewhere uh, in the middle. So let me uh, kind of um, conclude and, and wrap up. Well, estimates of economic effects of migration are so different to come back to the main topic of this particular session because they are actually different across different countries, because different studies measure often different parameters which are not comparable, and because it is difficult to place immigrants and natives into the same slice of the labor market, uh, which is due to downgrading and very often ignored. Secondly, attitudes of individuals towards migration policies are mainly driven by non-economic concerns. This makes, of course, migration a very unpredictable policy issue, and we have seen uh, the latest example, Angela Merkel, uh, strongly struggling with that. And uh, lastly, there is strong evidence that refugee migration to Denmark over the period over which we observe has been a main driver for the increase in vote shares for right-leaning anti-immigration parties. Now, uh, clearly, we uh, may want to discuss that later on in, 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 in this panel. This means uh, there are major challenges for Europe uh, in view of future migrations uh, from Africa uh, and uh, from the Middle East. Thank you. So, Anne, we'll turn to you now. So um, that's uh, almost as if we planned it, but uh, the end of Christian's uh, uh, talk uh, is very much the beginning of my talk. It's about uh, the, the movement of, of uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and so-called irregular migrants um, to Europe and the political effects of that. Uh, so on... In spite of the topic of the seminar, I'm going to talk mostly about politics. And one reason for that is exactly what Christian was saying, that uh, in, in the political debate, there is so much material you can take and cherry pick, which is what people are, are doing in the political debate, whether you are pro or against migration. Um, so I'm going to talk about the politics of it. And I'm going to look particularly at the relationship between uh, Europe and Africa. So Europe, or the EU rather, had a migration crisis, although many migration experts would argue that this wasn't really a crisis, or if it was a crisis, it was a crisis of, of Europe's own making uh, in terms of how they handled it. Um, in 2015, um, there was a, a large influx of, of migrants, uh, a big 
uh, jump in, in the numbers uh, crossing the Mediterranean uh, and arriving um, on the EU's southern shores. Um, now, in terms of numbers, you would think that this particular episode uh, had a seemingly outsized political effect. Uh, if you look at migrant figures from 2015, the EU had something like around 55 million international mi migrants at the time. And in the period from January 2015 till today, these irregular arrivals across the Mediterranean were 1.5 million. So seemingly not that big a, a figure. But there are reasons why um, it was seen as a crisis. Uh, one is that if you look at the, the um, new arrivals, so not migrants already uh, living in their host countries for a long time, then irregular migrants are a big share of, of, uh, of the new arrivals. Uh, they're also a fairly large share of, of the, the, the net migration surplus in Europe. Europe, uh, the EU, is one of the regions of the world where there is a net uh, immigration rather than emigration. Um, and also, of course, the boat migrants were very much uh, a visible chaotic form of migration, which caused the sense in many European capitals that, the, the, that Europe had lost control of its borders, lost control of deciding who gets to come and who, who gets to uh, be stopped. Now, 2015 didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there was a rising number of, of uh, boat migrants, um, especially from 2010 onwards, uh, mostly arriving in Italy. Um, there was also, a, um, after a fairly quiet, from the point of view of forced migration and refugees, uh, there had been a lull in, in conflict and, and conflict-related displacement in, in the first decade of the 2000s. Uh, but then that was followed by a very sharp rise, especially because of the war in Syria, but not only because of that. Um, so by 2015, you had the situation we had record number of refugees combined with very high also levels of south-north migration. Um, there was a very strong pressure on the host states, the refugee host states in, EU's, in the EU's neighborhood, like Turkey, like Lebanon, uh, Jordan. Um, so you had a scene set up uh, for uh, the next stage in this uh, refugee crisis. Um, I won't talk lots about this, but this is a typical example of how refugee movements, um, I'm sorry about the lurid, lurid colors, um, happen. So in the case of Syria, this is figures from 2015, uh, the biggest number of people affected by the conflict do not move at all, but they, they need humanitarian assistance, they're in trouble. Then the next biggest group among those 13.5 million uh, are internally displaced people, so they do not actually leave Syria. Uh, then the next largest group out of this uh, will be re regional refugees, and so people who go just across the, the border. And then finally, uh, you get people who move beyond that region, and often this is also a, um, a timeline. So you start with humanitarian need, and then you get displacement. Often what happens, you have the People will flee to the region, and they don't actually want to go any further. They're hoping to go back, but they will run out of resources. Uh, the host states will run out of patience uh, as numbers get bigger. Uh, all sorts of problems arrive, so people will start wanting to move further on to, to restart their lives. So the Syrian refugee crisis is quite typical of large refugee situations. Um, don't know how well this map comes up, but what happened in 2015 was that suddenly a new and much easier route opened up from Turkey to Greece. And there were a lot of Syrian refugees in, uh, um, in Turkey by 2015. This is a map from UNHCR, by the way. Um, and so suddenly, from very few people taking that route, you had 836,000 people arriving by sea in 2015 into Greece, into these small Greek islands very close to the coast of Turkey. Uh, most of them were refugees, obviously refugees, uh, not economic migrants, especially in the beginning. Uh, so this was the overall number of uh, or the, uh, the breakdown of the main population groups in the whole period from January 2015 to February 2016. Uh, and in the beginning, the vast majority were Syrians, 
after a while, uh, other groups started coming too. I'm going to skip that one. So this was the situation at the beginning of 2016, that you had a lot of people arriving, getting into Greece, then walking through the Balkans and uh, Eastern Europe, and making it to, to, to Germany, who decided to lift the Dublin requirement and allow people to, to walk through Europe and, uh, and claim asylum there. Uh, what you also had by then was ample proof that there was no... Uh, there was very poor cooperation between EU countries on this topic. Uh, very few uh, common EU measures actually worked. Uh, instead, what you had was a lot of unilateral policies and border closures starting with Hungary by October uh, 2015. Um, also a mood shift, uh, the terror attacks in Paris in November 2015, where it turned out that the, at least a couple of the terrorists had probably taken the same migration uh, trail as the, the refugees. Um, so people were also starting to talk much more about the potential of terrorism, crime, and other dangers. Um, so this was put a relatively eff effective stop to the, um, uh, in late February. A combination of Macedonia, which is the northern border with Greece, closing its border, and the EU-Turkey deal, uh, which EU negotiated with Turkey that against, uh, uh, in return for various uh, goods, especially money, uh, Turkey would stop the boats. It's not clear how long the deal will stick, but it's also not clear that this deal, uh, this deal needs to stick, because if you look at the bottom of this, this is another UNHCR map. It shows, so the EU-Turkey deal was in, I think, the 20th of March, uh, but the numbers of arrivals stopped earlier than that, and they stopped because Macedonia was closing its borders. So people didn't want to be stuck in Greece. Greece is not a place where you can um, rebuild your life very easily. There's very high unemployment. There's uh, it's an economy in crisis. So people wanted to move on. So the border closures were at least as important as the EU-Turkey deal, in my view. Now, so the politics, the repercussions of this. Well, anti-migrant sentiments, uh, which were already on the rise, uh, really uh, got wind in its sails. Um, I, in my view, Brexit had a lot to do with the, the migration worries, and what happened in Europe in 2015 was an important part of that. Uh, even though the UK actually didn't get that many refugees coming, um, com coming here, uh, they did manage unilaterally to stop most from arriving. Um, it led to all sorts of stricter asylum rules and immigration rules. Um, I'm talking about Denmark again, uh, they introduced, among other things, uh, the so-called jewelry law that anyone who, any refugee who arrived with more than uh, 10,000 Danish kroner, or about 1,000 pounds, uh, would have it confiscated to pay for their upkeep. Uh, and then you had debates like uh, about wedding rings and uh, engagement rings and uh, family heirlooms, whether that can be confiscated or not. Um, suggestions by countries like Norway that had always been a very strong advocate for refugee rights to scrap the whole refugee um, convention and start having quotas. Uh, there's been many more forced returns, including of people from uh, regions that have a lot of refugees, like Afghanistan. Uh, it was also very clear that EU burden sharing did not work. East-West differences came out very clearly. Uh, many Eastern European countries flatly uh, refused to have any sort of burden sharing mechanism where refugees from who had already been given refugee status um, in Greece and Italy would be resettled in other European countries. Um, so what EU managed to do was to sort of clamp down on border control but with very little other types of cooperation. You've seen sort of Greece being sealed off from the rest of the EU um, for irregular migrants and you see a similar thing for, for Italy now. It's very hard to, to get onwards from Italy if you arrive um, on, on the boats from North, North Africa. So it's EU in a security mode, very much thinking of migration, not in terms of the economic uh, positives, negatives, but as a matter of the very survival of, of the EU as an entity in some, uh, in some um, uh, discussions of this. Um, so what does that say about EU-Africa relationships? So after closing the, uh, the 
the Aegean route, which is the much safer and simpler route, uh, most irregular migrants who, who attempt the trip with boats now come from Libya and they end up in Italy. Uh, it's a much more dangerous route, uh, both getting to Libya, being in Libya, and then crossing uh, the Mediterranean. Um, so the deterrence perspective of EU um, migration policy uh, has now shifted towards Africa, towards North Africa particularly. Um, migration is very much dominating the EU's agenda vis-a-vis -vis Africa now. You can see it in the summitry ever since the Malta summit on migration. Um, you can see attempts at replicating the spirit of the EU-Turkey deal in Africa, especially with Libya, um, making deals with various actors, whether they're militias, whether they're the government, um, to stop the boats. It's all quite secretive. It's hard to know what's actually going on in terms of deal making in, in Libya. Um, attempts at pushing the de facto EU border control to Libya's southern border so that people don't get as far as into Libya to, to, to make the, the last uh, stage with, uh, via boat. Um, there's also a strong element of deterrence in, in European, uh, in EU policy on irregular migrants. So with the conclusion of the EU-Turkey deal, about 50,000, 60,000 um, migrants and refugees were stranded in, in, in Greece. They couldn't uh, move further because the border northwards was closed. Um, they live in very dismal conditions. It's quite hard to imagine that in the EU today, people can live in such squalor, but they do. And it's the same thing happening in Libya too. So life is made very difficult for the, the migrants who are sort of stranded and not able to go forward in order to try to push them back and to deter others from doing the same, uh, from trying the, the, the route. Uh, there's also a lot of attempts at creation, creating migration compacts or agreements with so-called priority countries, which are African countries on the route, the migration route, uh, mostly from West Africa, but also from uh, the sort of conflict belt of the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. So the long-term ambition of these compacts is very good. It's about uh, creating economic growth, inclusive growth, job creation, and also to create formal migration opportunities so it doesn't have to be done this dangerous and irregular way. Uh, about having refugee quotas, etc. In practice, what's happened so far is it's all about border control, it's about crackdown on smugglers, at least in theory, uh, it's about return agreements of failed asylum seekers, because the internal debate in the European Union now is, is, doesn't allow for a discussion about actually having formal uh, migration from Af Africa to Europe. So my argument is that this is creating a very skewed relationship between the EU and Africa. Um, migration priorities are increasingly influencing aid agendas, for instance, without much thought about how you can use aid to stop migration, which means I think it will be very likely a wasteful, inefficient strategy. Uh, it gives some African countries better bargaining chips with the European Union, while others are being ignored. And it creates, all in all, a very transactional relationship that can be abused for you know, blackmail and uh, 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 yeah. I'm going to run through quickly the last, some concluding thoughts. Um, as someone who works on refugees mostly, it's, it's sort of sad to say uh, that the deterrence of the European Union has sort of worked. So numbers of irregular migrants arriving in Europe is much, much lower now than, certainly than 2015, but also they're lower than 2014, so before the whole thing happened. Um, but of course, migration pressures from Africa to Europe due to demographics will not go away, uh, and economics. Um, I won't talk about sustainable development goals now, but there is a lot of talk about how international migration should be part of the development of, of poorer countries and, and the future of, of, of people. So we need a more positive debate uh, and a recognition that, uh, yes, you have to have migration control, but the way it's being done right now, it's not very productive for, for anyone and certainly not for the, the migrants caught up in it. So I'll stop there. Thank you.
Anders. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, my presentation uh, actually follows very naturally from what Christian and Anne has done. And I, uh, I'm not an expert on immigration. Uh, I'm a policy uh, thinker. Uh, it's uh, what I really want to basically say uh, from my own, my own background, which is that my family were refugees uh, and then migrants. Uh, and so I now live in Malaysia. <clears throat> uh, but I, you know, we have a 30 million population with officially 3 million migrant workers, but probably unofficially uh, up to 7 million. And of course, luckily, it's not uh, highly populated. Uh, but migration has huge economic consequences, uh, particularly on our own labor force uh, and our industrial policy, which you need to think about. But I really want to say is, very quickly, is that the policies has traditionally been considered uh, on a national basis, uh, the Westphalian uh, nation state. But unfortunately, climate change, which I'm gonna uh, argue, is probably one of the major drivers uh, of migration. Uh, has, has regional uh, and even conflict issues, which particularly uh, is going to be very difficult for emerging markets. And so we need a very systemic uh, way to think about uh, this issue where we take geopolitics, economics, technology, social inequities, and climate change uh, on this migration issue. And rich states like Europe, which uh, Anne and Christian have uh, addressed, uh, uh, you know, clearly uh, needs to address this. Now, very quickly, this is uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, material available about how the migration started, and you can see a lot of it comes from the Middle East, and a lot of it is going to Europe, uh, and then Africa is also a major driver. Uh, it's, migration's got a historical trend, according to McKinsey data. It's moved from 3.1% in 1960 uh, to 3.4% uh, uh, on generally. 90% uh, voluntary, uh, remaining 10% are refugees and asylum, and uh, there are over 347 know, uh, living outside the country of birth, myself included. Uh, the UNHCR is finding huge uh, uh, fiscal stress uh, with 65 million, according to their data, uh, forcibly displaced, uh, 22.5 million refugees, all these data, a lot you know. Now we go back to this uh, Huntington stuff. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Viner in 1995 basically argued that you know, migration creates its own flow, uh, and then a lot of it, uh, the West may not be able to control, according to Huntington. Now, it's very interesting, uh, in a very major study by uh, Ruveni, 38 cases of global environmental migration, half had violence and half had less, but 36 of them were in emerging markets, only two in advanced countries. So the bulk of the burden uh, arises from mig migration, in, in, and including the host, uh, are emerging markets, and uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of them involve migration. The big picture, of course, is that water stress causes civil unrest. Uh, I myself, uh, you know, looking into the Syrian crisis, realized that four years, I don't, I, I, this, is the, this is what the scientists say, four years of drought in Syria with an incompetent government uh, uh, created uh, this, these, uh, you know, regional interference and then, you know, unmanageable and then huge migration issues. Now, you know, those of you who had a chance to reach uh, Jeffrey Parker uh, said that climate change has recently ca caused massive destruction uh, through, you know, global cooling, then global warming up. Uh, all these, uh, you know, one knows uh, quite well. And the basic uh, projects by the World Bank is that if the water stress Will, 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 will then reduce GDP, and particularly in the high-stress uh, areas. For example, in India, the one reason why the Himalayans uh, is uh, so important is that you know, seven or eight of the world's largest river feeding the bulk of the population in Asia, the Indus, the Irrawaddy, the, 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 the Mekong, the, the, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, you know, they feed you know, uh, nearly three, four billion people. And if that dries up, uh, or melts, 60% uh, of Indian agriculture depends upon uh, well, well, well uh, uh, water, and this is dropping very, very fast. So, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me, uh, according to Walter Scheidel, uh, his latest book, uh, is that inequality is solved fundamentally through violence uh, and war. And uh, if you add that 
you know, into uh, climate change, uh, according to the third demographic transition, David Coleman, uh, the share of national population that is of all foreign origin will reach between a quarter and a third out of six out of the seven countries in the EU. Now, if you look at the latest uh, 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 election victories, or, or you know, the, the, the winning government has only 31% of the vote. And if the population reaches 10, 15%, uh, that changes the voting pattern uh, dramatically. Now, you know, if you then look at the, uh, the, 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 the Middle East and North Africa, the, the, the conflicts are proliferating. Uh, MENA accounts for 56% of the world's uh, internally displaced and refugees, uh, including, uh, not including Sahel, which is even more water stressed uh, than the Middle East. And it has the world's largest, uh, fastest growing young and working population. So they present very huge challenges for uh, workers. Now, from a rich country point of view, it's very good to uh, you know, bring in the workers. But exact, exactly as Christian uh, has said, uh, it has none uh, economic, social, cultural uh, reactions. Uh, let me put it very, very mildly. So 90% of the refugees are under the age of 18. I recently visited the, uh, the, 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 the refugee camp in Jordan, mostly Syrian uh, workers. And it was an interesting statistic I had not realized. The average Syrian is used to using per capita water eight times that of the Jordanians. And you have to finance, fund these, bring water to 80,000 of these refugees by trucks. You can't even put uh, 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 pipe water in because they're supposed to be temporary. So you know, it, it, it struck to me how how, how difficult uh, these humanitarian, as well as fiscal, as well as logistical issues these are. And of course, you know, as the IMF has uh, uh, did in a very useful study on this, is that the impact on GDP on the MENA countries, not just on the exporting country, but on the uh, host country, is going to be, you know, a big shock. And then where is the money going to come from? Uh, so it's a serious issue. So what are the key, you know, policy choices? Well, if you're the rich countries, it's, it's quite, you know, if the world is going to warm up, where, and, and particularly it's going to heat up in the, in the equator, which is underwater stress, where will they go? Up north into cooler climates, uh, and where there is more land, more water, uh, uh, less population. Uh, and, and, and is it going to be, you know, uh, stoppable? And so what are your options? And so there are, there are the three options. The one is to allow the inflows, which is on humanitarian grounds, uh, but it causes the populist uh, reaction that Anne has talked about. The second is to spend money uh, on the, to preempt uh, in the uh, so-called home countries, uh, which are failing, failed, and, 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 and um, uh, fragile. Uh, but if they are struck by a co you know, f continuing years of drought, uh, you end up with worst uh, 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 with governments that cannot cope, and then you know, it, it will have a problem. And so the third solution is to have a global compact on how to deal with the negative effects of climate change holistically. Uh, but uh, at this particular point, we are in deep trouble because after the 2007, 2008 crisis in the advanced countries, they don't feel so generous anymore because they've got the big debt and they've got the debt overhang and the fiscal issues. And so we do need a global taxation problem. And we can do this in a, you know, a, 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 you know, a Westphalian world. And why is the Westphalian model f failing? If you look back at the uh, uh, um, Africa uh, uh, and all these countries, a lot of the borders are completely drawn during the colonial period as straight lines, which have no bearing on actually tribes, uh, culture, religion, uh, even ge geographical issues. And so, you know, it, 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 since a lot of these borders were not quite patrolled, uh, you know, the migration has always been there. But if the water is not a problem, uh, then you won't have migration outside the region. But today, the, the, the climate change issues are going to be very big. And so I, it raises a very fundamental um, global public good issue, which is that you know, the, 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 the humanitarian approach to uh, refugee handling is neither operationally nor fiscally sustainable. Uh, uh, you know, just think about the scale, right? The three hurricanes, just for the United States, including Puerto, Puerto Rico, excluding you know, Dominica and you know, Cuba and all the others, 
is estimated at $280 billion, right? Three quarters of the total assets of the World Bank, okay? And how much is the World Bank lending every year? 23 billion and net only 9 billion. This is, this, this is just, you know, this is supposed to be the premier uh, institution to do this. In the meantime, of course, I'm a former central banker. Central bankers are printing billions, trillions. Uh, the total size of the central banking community is 22 trillion at the last count. Uh, and they claim that they have nothing to do with climate change or, 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 or policy uh, resource allocation issues. But the problem is that you know, out of this 280 billion, you, you already saw this. If it is Texas and Florida, you know, a very quick reaction. If it's on Puerto Rico, not necessarily. And who is going to help uh, invest in Dominica, you know, Cuba, and all the others where they can't uh, deal with this? So, you know, the, 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 if, we, if we go through a series of climate warming issues, which are, we are going to see, where is the money to help contain the damage, improve the infrastructure, and deal with keeping the migration at a stable level. Because if not, it will be you know, uh, uh, driven. Uh, so we cannot hope that climate change will not worsen. Um, uh, some of you don't even think about this, uh, may not have thought about this, as I certainly didn't. If the, 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 why are the hurricanes, are hurricanes occurring? If the hurricane, uh, if, the, if the water is, is, is more warm, it creates that air change. But if the more icebergs melt, the huge amount weight of water actually causes the continental uh, shelves to shift, then creating earthquakes and uh, 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 tsunamis and natural disasters. Uh, some of the people you know, think, although this is not proven, that the earthquake in China may have been caused uh, you know, in 2008, 2009, was caused by the Three Gorges, which was very, you know, heavy weight of water causing you know, uh, the, the, the more recent earthquakes. So nobody's making you know, estimates of how much you know, these things could cost. We make our fiscal budgets, and including our aid, very much on a pay-as-you-go basis. 